I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to elders past and present and to elders from other communities who may be joining us here today. So we've assembled what I'm sure will be an incredibly insightful panel discussion by selected members of Ocular Collective. Having been a leading voice in uh, photographic documentary practice since its inception in 2000, Oculi is uniquely placed to collectively discuss experiences as both image makers and as humans who have witnessed and documented a range of important and often traumatic events. So the topic of the discussion relates directly to Act 3 within Oculi's current major exhibition. And I'd strongly encourage you to view works uh, in this section of the show following this morning's uh, panel to fully appreciate the experiences our panelists will be speaking to. I'm off the book this morning. This morning's panel will be moderated by Dr. Elias Connor Ashley, who has worked in more than 40 countries over the past decade, documenting agricultural projects, development, education, health and research for clients, including Red Cross, World Vision, UNICEF, the World Bank, and World Health Organization. I think significantly, given today's discussion, Connor is personally guided by a principle to facilitate the stories that people want to tell about themselves stories that educate and empower. So on that note, it gives me a great pleasure to hand over to Connor. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. Thanks for coming out. It's a little drizzly, but we're going to go for an hour this morning, and we're going to hear from five people here, five members of what we like. We're all working on around or seemingly even with trauma in very different ways, but I guess we all have that common thread, being documentarians and members of Ocula. Um, trauma is deeply personal, and while it's also seemingly ubiquitous at the same time. As a collective, we do, as I just said, we do in very different ways work on, around, and with trauma. And today the aim is, is to hear and see images from a group of people who are responding to this this thing, which is in Act 3 as well. Just quickly before we do start seeing images, I really just wanted to, to, to say that the stories and the images that you see, they might be confronting and you might find them overwhelming and that's absolutely understandable. And if any time if you are finding it difficult, um, please feel free to step out. Um, and also we will be around later if you kind of want to talk about something on out of us uh, professionals, but we are, I think, all really acutely aware of how we try to work around this really tricky and, and sensitive topic. <coughs> um, so, first of all, we're going to hear from Jeremy Piper, um, one of our founding members and a photojournalist who's been working probably since before I was born. Um, <laughs> I'm not that old. So, we'll see a few images per person and I'll also talk to them. And then if you have individual questions, great. Otherwise, at the end, I think it will be quite an interesting, juicy, flowing conversation between us all and hopefully yourselves as well. So, this is Jeremy. No, I know that. So, it's, hello everyone. Thanks for coming. Nice to be first up today. <laughs> so, I suppose you never go out to, or well, I personally don't go out to make trauma as my with uh, my work practice on a daily basis, but you do seem to find that with certain jobs that you just you end up doing throughout the days and weeks of your career and putting this process together for the show and the exhibition and looking at what you actually, the grief and trauma kind of thing that we're working towards today, it actually opened up a lot of kind of things that where you realise you've done, you, you actually have put yourself in, you have put yourself in a position where you uh, in the, um, you're sharing grief with people that you don't know, um, and you're there as an observer, but you kind of walk away where you can't, not after a while, and it just, it does sink into your psyche a little bit. So today I've decided to show some old work, a little bit older, um, in East Timor, but I think it's kind of, um, this is during the referendum, six weeks before the referendum next team or and I was travelling to Dean at that stage. And the first picture was actually a uh, family. We'd been travelling around for a number of weeks and we stumbled across a van uh, going back to a uh, village. And 
And as we turned up, we saw the, uh, the rural operation that was going on. Just kept following it. And these are, we were like the great white hopes when we arrived, because they hadn't seen any. We were called. We arrived just before the United Nations turned up, so they thought we were kind of some ways part of the UN as well. And we were, um, they hadn't seen journalists or anyone for a long time. And we were first to arrive. And so they kind of looked at us as the, the great white hopes, we kind of called it, because we'll just get the information out there. So the, the family were just dropped to their knees in that original picture. That was the mother, the, the, the sister and the auntie, I reckon. And they were, um, they just dropped to their knees. The most emotional scene that I've ever, for me personally, was just raw. And, uh, and then this is the son that was, he was killed by um, the TNI, the Indonesian military, during an um, uh, annual protest for independence and they shot him and then the body was brought back to the village and this is the normal morning over, the, over that. Um, yeah, it was, it was, for me, I was probably, I don't know, early 20s, late 20s, and it was the first kind of real, raw, the rawness I saw, but it, it sticks with you. Um, but at that stage, you're a little bit colder, you know, you're kind of more of the, you, you, you're there for not, um, Traveling those places for me was a learning curve anyway for political unrest and um, but this family were, their village was raised by the militia and they had to shelter in a, an old school. Um, there was, the militia probably were brought back by Indonesians and they were probably, to me, were probably the most brutal um, and the stories that you were hearing along the way over 24 years ago, I suppose. Um, but they got their freedom eventually. But and this young boy, they what was one of the ploys was they would leave a hand grenade outside a village, and they'd just drop it. And the young kids, the three of them that day, they didn't know what it was, and they they found the hand grenade and they pulled the pin, and they killed three young boys. So it was through, sh through shrapnel. So the, this is the young boy they found on the hill as part of the ploy to by the militia. So it was, um, it's one of those jobs too where you kind of, there's no, you know, you're not there for the money, you're not there for the, um, I don't know how to explain it, but Greece one of those things where you watch it flow when you're in situations, particularly, maybe not this one, but you're actually, you're witnessing it, and you see it enough where it, the shock initially, and then it's this wave of emotion of realization that comes with it, and then there's this uh, shock that the peacefulness that kind of it's, it's quite a weird thing to witness. Um, I think the realization when they lose someone is the, the hardest thing to watch because they're, it's all happening in front of you, and then just watching the emotions of people go through it. That's where it's. Um, I don't know, it gives you perspective in life, I think, like that seeing all this, you kind of, you realise that you don't sweat on the little things. I don't know, for me personally, you just take away so much where it's, you know, nothing's too big a deal when you start seeing people's lives. was pretty blessed in my existence, I suppose. So it's, um, it just gives you perspective in life when you look back at people. And this one's pretty, this one's one of my favourites, to be honest. So this is when the UN arrived and they set up camp and they raised the, the UN flag for the first time in Dili. So this is all pro, pro independent supporters arrived, and uh, that was a sign of peace. So I mean, the strength comes with it, you know. People find strength in their in their fear as well. Mike, the question from me uh, and anyone else, just feel free to chime in. But how did you then navigate working as a photojournalist back in Australia, where trauma that you were witnessing? <coughs> how did you kind of navigate? Can recontextualizing the trauma at home in Australia after, I guess, experiencing something which is in another culture, something that's very extreme, you know, like it's quite visually quite extreme, what you were witnessing. How did you go navigating working again back in Australia and having to, I guess, work with and around trauma? When it's, I think Australia is very hard to photograph at the best of times. It's such a hard country to photograph. Um, and I, it's, we culturally, you're freer to shoot in Asia, in some countries, than you are better in other countries. In Australia here, everyone's very cynical about the media and cameras. 
um, you find a lot more freedom. So I've, coming back here and photograph, for me working with the newspaper and Hope Forever, um, on a daily basis you're doing stabbings and shootings, and especially in Sydney at the moment, you're kind of rocking up to a lot of um, under, underworld kind of hits and stuff. So, but you see the reactions from people. So the family arrive, you know, see the, the raw emotion in that. And I can shoot that in a way where it's at a distance too. So you've got the long lens, you don't really want to go too close to them. And I think that's a cultural thing too, as well as a safety thing too. Um, but you are a lot more reserved shooting grief in these places in Australia, particularly but overseas. You seem to be able to really um, navigate. Yeah, the freedom, I think that's it. So yeah, I find it, Australia's difficult to photograph any of the best of times, but whether someone's emotional, it's difficult, yeah, I think it's really Hi, what's, um, you know, you did that first shoot when you were young, 20, young, 21 year old. How, how has that changed for you, you know, a couple of decades on? Like, is, is your emotional response the same, or have you protected yourself, or? Yeah. You become a bit numb to it. What's your experience? Yeah, I don't like it. I don't like it anymore. I I can't watch those shows or TV where mm. it's going people hurting and stuff like that. And particular jobs where, say, the bushfires we travelled through, and I don't like going back to them the next day. I don't like seeing it. I like being on top of it when the story is unfolding and really mm -hmm. working your way through it and being in front of it, and driving the story and the narrative. But I actually don't like going back there seeing that the personal trauma mm. of those individuals later. So I'd be rather kind of just keep going. I don't like revisiting. Um, what is, why do you think, has that changed over the years? Yeah, I think, I'm, I don't think I've ever liked it. Mm. Well, it's not like stealing people's emotions and just running away, it's just my little kind of shield. Mm. You kind of do it, you're reporting on it, you, 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 you're getting it, you're understanding it, but then you, I personally can't, I don't work that way, I can't. It's just too much for me, mm. going back and seeing people. So I kind of like doing the way through, not like doing them the way through, but I will capture them the way through and then, mm -hmm. uh, because yeah, I just don't like it. It's just, I know it's important to people who have a different work practice. Yeah. But, um, boundaries, I guess. Yeah, yeah it's a security blanket, I think. Can you say, again, because you, you have started many years ago, so your career is long, so how, how is the perception and the reaction of people Change, have changed in these like 20 or more years because to me today is, is very very complicated to be a photojournalist mm -hmm. because it, it seems like people don't care or, or the pictures are the same when you can see how rich it can be a visual story but, but these days it's very hard to see in mass media these mm -hmm. kind of images unfortunately that really tell a story so mm -hmm. how how the, yeah the reaction of people has changed you, you said it before, that no one cares anymore. I think that's the problem. I don't think anyone cares, the readers and the viewers. I think because they're so saturated. So they don't stop? No one said, no one, yeah, this was done in 2000, so there were still magazines. Publications were around, you could get a run, you could actually get your stuff printed. And that was pretty much the pinnacle of the year 2000, really kind of came on. That whole kind of social media, Facebook wasn't there, I don't think, but um, there was a platform there for the media, the magazines, you could get it out, and that's what it, most people would see, the papers, and really take it in. But these, um, it's changed a lot. I don't think people, they're too busy to actually understand. There's too much media, there's too many cameras, so the, the saturation of the images just makes people move on. I don't think they want to take it in either. There's people uh, affected by it, or everywhere they look, there's, some, there's not never great news going on, really. And, Throwing another one in the hat that's not great news. It doesn't sink in with people as much, I don't think, these days. But yeah, it's. You spoke a little bit about being seen as, um, you know, hope, a, a voice of hope, really, because you were able to get this community story out. Um, is there anything, though, that you captured? Because you've obviously got this social responsibility, so there's a good reason to be sharing these images. Is there anything you captured? that you chose not to share? Yeah, um, through that one, through the team on <clears throat> trip, I wouldn't say there would be, 
when it, it was the tension for Timor, it was, you, you know, there were the killings, there were the, um, the threats, um, the ongoing violence, but the shootings and that would, uh, we didn't really, it's funny, we looked back and we looked at our series, and there wasn't many guns in it. It was all the tension and it was all this build up. So the, the, there's nothing in that set that I felt needed to be hidden and all not shown, I think, as well. But um, it was the raw tension that you kind of, it's hard to capture too, than the, than the guns and the, and the bullets and that kind of stuff. So it was an interesting way to do it, I think. You we worked away now. I think it didn't get really many guns in the edit, you know, in this kind of conflict area. And just the, you, you weren't drawn to that. That wasn't like the thing, oh, there's an AK-47, that would make a great picture. You know, it's not like you're looking for that. It's kind of, you, when you, you, you immerse yourself in the, in the, in the, in the world that you're looking at there. And, um, yeah, it's just, a, it was a, a learning curve on a lot of levels, just for me, that trip. To jump from Timor, which was the world's, Came the world's newest nation in the early 2000s, you know, one of our closest, more complex <coughs> neighbours, at least our relationship with them, to then coming back home and working within your own community. The second Oculite member, we're going to hear from Rachel Mouncey, will share with us how she's worked on and around trauma at home. Good morning, everybody. So, um, I'm from Malakuda. And a couple of years ago, I'm sure some of us know about the bushfires coming through Malakuta. So for me at the time, I've been working on the um, regional papers in the, in the south coast, and I'd just taken holiday <laughs> after working intensely for a whole year and not even having weekends off. So I was ready for my holiday, and then all of a sudden we were having the firestorms come through. And for me, as a beginning, I guess an emerging photojournalist as well, it was like a baptism by fire, basically. And so the reason um, I put this photo up first was because unlike um, Jeremy and Dean and what Jeremy was just saying, I, I was at home and I actually saw the media come to me and come to our town and I was within it also questioning what is it that I'm documenting and why am I documenting this and why do I have what is my responsibility here? What do I document? And, and it, was in, it was in front of me. And, um, what I found like a few weeks later was actually as, as a community, people didn't want to be photographed and people didn't want to be in the media. And um, I was very, um, I guess, a little bit torn about whether, whether I continue to document our story or, or not document our story. And um, there it was in front of me, I mean, so many of my friends and, and community had lost their houses, but being, as Jeremy said, like Australians are, are difficult to document, and um, it wasn't easy to um, be within my community that, at that time and not document, but also the trust was um, also there. So one one morning, I, I remember I remembered hearing that a film was saying, "I don't want any more photos," and you could hear people saying, "What?" Oh, that car slowing down, and there'll be someone taking a photo of that street, or that's my house. And there were signs going up all around the houses that, that said no photos, no photos, no photos. And then we came across this one, and I, I, I felt really honoured, you know, to be the person in the community that wasn't allowed to photograph. I can still photograph here, yeah, you know. So for me, I, I felt like I'd earned a little bit of my stripes, you know, that, that the community trusted me, and I think that that has also brought about that question of trust and are you, you know, why are you, why are you there? Like I remember on the very first day when the fires went through, um, I was asked if I, oh, did you, did you get any photos of anybody returning to their houses? You know, did you get that, that shot? And I remember feeling really guilty that I didn't get that shot, that I didn't photograph my friends as they returned to their houses and then later seeing them on the ABC News and all the other photos of what other people have taken of them, but I actually had made a conscious decision to wait and to wait until they told me that I could come with them to their houses when they were ready for me. And whether they were or whether they weren't wasn't my choice. It was actually 
their choice. So I think for me, documenting my town was um, a, a, a game of sitting back and being trusted. So this photograph is, um, I, I put this photograph up because I wanted to talk about that um, when something like this happens, for me, because I am close to these people, I would ask them about, the, for me it wasn't just photographing someone in their burnt house, for me it was deeper than that and asking them, what now, what do you want to say? Not what story do I want to put on you, but what, what is it that you want to say? What, how do you really, really feel and what do you want to say? And so this particular person, Max, he, um, he spent, he was in a bunker and then he ended up being um, flown out. He lived right up in the middle of nowhere, but for him it was the death of the landscape. So it wasn't, and that, that for me was really important. Within Malakuta was this thing of, and, and probably for many of the bushfire um, people around, that it, it's not if you lose your loved ones, for him losing the landscape was like losing a part of himself. And so his, he, he didn't know how he was going to move forward, not hearing any birds or, or the silence. And that's what I found within Malakuta was our own, our own trauma. And I guess that I put myself in that because if I live there and that is, it, it's interesting that, that, that I was documenting as well, our trauma. And for us, it was the silence of the bush. It was, it was really silent and it, and it needed this time. And I think that that's really important. That's something that I've learned is that things take time and it takes time to document and get your feelings together and how you are feeling as a person going through this. And these people needed time and different to what Jeremy is shooting is in the moment. And you know, like I respect that Jeremy doesn't want to go back, but I have found that time people can talk with, with time and they, it has a lot more meaning for me to document in that way. And so with this, this is one of my, my best friends, Natalie, and um, I, as I said, like I, I waited, not like I was waiting, but you know, I, I was open to people doing things and I would ask, you know, what are you going to do um, with your house and how are you going to grieve your house? Um, because I think that people would, like, oh, 40 lives are lost, or this is lost, but I think that the loss of a house is, is such a loss. You know, it's such a deep, deep loss. And, and so in Malakuta, people started doing things like having little rituals and having little house funerals. And, and um, that, that was quite interesting. So in this photo, Natalie had gone back um, a few weeks later, and it took weeks, you know, it was, it was, it was like the death person or something, it did take weeks and, and this was probably a month later and she rang me up and said, hey Rachel, I'm going to be um, looking into the, into, the, into the ashes, like people started sifting through the ashes and seeing how important it was to find something of meaning for, for them that they could hang on to and um, before this photo was taken, she actually found these little um, stamps that she needed for her candle business and then she felt like, oh, I found that. And then she said, I'm going to light a candle to, to say goodbye to, to everything else. So I, I felt really privileged. It's not just a photo, it's just it's actually being quiet and being in the space and being allowed, allowed to be there. So for me, it's been a real privilege to be able to document my community in this way. And this is, I put this photo up because um, as a representation of Later, you know, like you're going through it, you're going through the motions, but you've also, I've learnt um, that I also held a lot of um, grief within me, and I wanted to start expressing that as well because it, it wasn't just that I, I'd gone through it too. So I, I realised that I'd been really quiet for a long time, and at one stage I'd stopped photographing because I, I was I was tired, um, maybe not tired, <coughs> anymore, but I was. I, I felt like I'd started taking on a lot and I actually went really quiet and, I, and that expectation to photograph every day because it is around you and it's all, you know, every day you walk out of the house, like the houses weren't cleaned up for months and everyone you see, so many people you see is still grieving and um, it's not just a question of getting on with it. I don't think that um, you can just get on with it. Things do take time and we, we 
have a long time to process things and so for me I went really quiet during, um, I think it was after the first year, I just sort of went away and hadn't worked in my dark room and I hadn't done anything and I noticed that I really wanted to say something as well and what was I really concerned about and so this is my own little documentation of, of the land that I'm, that I'm really concerned about what the future is for our land and whether, you know, like all these people are grieving but we're also grieving the loss of the landscape and how connected are we really to that landscape and so for me, and this was for me really pivotal because I started to pick up my camera again and actually ask myself what it is that, that I need to do and to, to get through this, this um, period of time. So this is my little film shot that I purposely took of, of I started going out to the places that were really hard hit that I don't believe will ever come back. So I wanted to tell my own story. Yeah, thank you. Oh, there's one more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit, I think I put that in there. There's a question mark, that one. <laughs> Well, that, well, yeah, after saying all that, finishing off, this is just, these are my neighbours across the road during the fires, and, um, yeah, I don't know why I put that one in, but that's my neighbours going through the fires, and, um, yeah, they're talking to our other neighbourhoods in Marimbula, and, um, yeah, I think it was interesting. How close, actually, what we're talking about with the camera, you know, like, um, Jeremy was saying, being far away, whereas the only lens I had during the fires was a, um, I think a wide-angle lens, <laughs> so I had to go really close whole time so I found that really interesting being so close to people but also being like one of those old school photojournalists and being actually yeah my, my lens was in everybody's faces all the time <laughs> but they but there was that trust as well that yeah you can photograph this I was never to, I was actually never told to to go away ever so yeah. Rachel have you had much feedback from your community about your work you know a lot of media came in and did their thing but have you have people given you feedback about you making a record of the town for the yeah. Thing. What's been yeah, and I've had um, only, and I've only had positive feedback. So that's been for me, it's been really humbling, but also um, made me want to continue in, in um, documenting our communities we go through this. Because every time I think that it's over, something there's so many chapters unfolding, and, and I've had people saying, you know, when are you, you going to put it all together? And um, I just keep saying, well, just stuff keeps unfolding. So I've had a really positive feedback from from everybody in, in the community who I've, I've documented as well. Can I ask a, a question on a really personal level? You, you were starting out as a photojournalist, you had this story breaking, you, you're in regional Victoria, you're trying to make a name for yourself, this happens to your community, and all the media come in. Can you talk about the conflict of wanting to be part of something, but also defensive of your own community? Well, when the media came in, it was really funny because I was really, um, <laughs> I, I wasn't used to people being on my patch. <laughs> You're on my patch. And um, so I, I learned a lot about, um, and also, yeah, I was protective of people. I started to see things like um, people were characters to people. Oh, he looked good. You know, oh, he's got a white beard, he looks all right. And I started to see things so differently that I too, you know, I'm someone that likes to find people and, and really dig in and get, get a really lovely story out of them, but I started to see that, oh, yeah, he, he looks like he'd be a good character, or that one over there, oh, she's, you know, like I was walking down the street and, um, like, a major news product, my friend had, um, I hadn't seen her throughout the whole fires, and she stopped in a car and came out and was, was crying hysterically and hugging me and, um, like, a news crew, like, I can't remember one of the major news crews came out and they were filming it and I said, no, 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 don't, don't, this doesn't need to go on national television because you don't know her story, you don't know that if she sees herself over and over again, she's, she's not going to want to see herself in ads and things like that. And that, that is something that I did become quite protective of, of seeing, <coughs> oh, I'll just grab that person over there and, and everyone's vulnerable and their story continues on long after the the media has gone and that's something that I have learned is that I know that there was ads running on um, ABC say and uh, images and I know that one of my images has these people in it and they actually said to me I can't I can't watch the ABC this whole year because I see myself on, on the ad mm. and I don't want to see myself in that situation anymore so there was so much for me 
that I've learned just through listening to what happens later on mm. with, with those images. Yeah. And can I ask you what these experience have, has, you know, teach you about when, when you are going to be in the patch of someone else? <laughs> so how, you know, because it's, it's first of all, motivation because you think it's the hardest thing to document your own community. It's very hard. But then, Still, how are you going to deal next time that you are going to be in a major story and you are like, I feel like that journalist, you know, that came to my place in my community and maybe was looking for a character. So it's tricky because, you know, sometimes maybe even if you are very ethical and you need to produce a picture because, you know, the newspaper was paying you and you have to come back. So how do you deal with it? I don't know yet. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't left. <laughs> she's going really hard if you find the characters that she should. Oh yeah, I think I would. I don't know. I, don't know. I, think that, um, I think that I do question a lot more now um, why I would photograph that person or, yeah, like, I think that it's made me a lot deeper in that sense. I think that I, I do question a lot. Maybe it's made me a little bit more tentative as well, with maybe like Sean says, maybe I, I, I probably <laughs> can't help myself either. I, I do have to dig. Uh, it's something that journalists often have to continually fight with, that, that sort of ethical question and that dilemma. And I think it's, it sits on the, a different level for each person. And you've just got to find the way in which you're comfortable. But the doggedness that Rachel has, and she does have it, you know, there is such an asset to having that as well. As Jeremy talked about last night, you have to have, you know, the courage to go in and push to the front and sometimes, because otherwise you're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's not like there's one thing always. I think it kind of swings back and forward. And, but the experiences from photographing something close, they can open you up to new ways of thinking, whether or not that those are adopted or not but they definitely have the possibility to a different perspective, I would say. A few segues, Sean. <laughs> so it's actually quite interesting because we've gone from Jeremy to sort of our local community, and this is, this is a, a, a body of work um, on my mum. Um, she died in 2017, but um, before that, um, she was quite sick for a long time and went through some, some pretty serious health, health stuff. Um, ended up in hospital and ICU for a long time. And um, yeah, when, when she actually passed away, this is a, a picture we pulled out of a family photo of my father and I, and we got it framed. And um, so I'll start with that. That's my mum Felicity and me, my little great sweater <laughs> on the front step of our, our home. Um, so that, that sits now on our mantelpiece at my, my dad's my family home with my dad. Um, so mum had a, um, she just had a fall. She was like um, 70, what do you say, 74. So she had a fall and broke her femur. She'd already had two hip replacements. And then anyone knows if you fall and you have a hip replacement mm -hmm. and you break your femur again, it's not a, a fun experience. So she had to have a hip revision. So she had two hips done, two knees, and then she had to go back to the hospital to have the hip, the titanium rod taken out, drilled down further, and have a longer one put in. It's, yeah, it's pretty intense. Um, but she had a few health issues, went to hospital, um, had a cardiac arrest, was in ICU, and, and I was grieving, I had trauma, I think I was <coughs> grief, I was kind of unknown to this, um, how to deal with something so acute. Um, in, in terms of a, a health issues, and I've been a photographer for a long time and have photographed um, lot, lots of situations, bushfires. And early in my career, was in, like went to go to Centre Bali for the bombings and uh, things like this, but never really had something so close, you know. That and you know, growing up, my dad had like Time Life books, and I loved Eugene Smith, and I loved the, the war photographers who were in all the action. And that was kind of what I wanted to do, or well, I thought I wanted to do. And, um, but when trauma came close to me, I found it really hard. Like, I couldn't photograph it. It was like too close. Um, and so the, the pictures that I have of my mum in this series, the black and white pictures, 
were ones that she asked me to take of her in hospital. And that's why they're just like, like that. Because she wanted to see what she looked like. Um, so I, this is going to a hospital, driving, you know, driving around. But I remember once in the hospital, she was in ICU for six weeks. And the first few times, like the first week or so, I'd go there every day and spend a lot of time. And it was uh, quite traumatic just to, to be with someone like that. The doctor came in and she said to me, which is something I just find really, really valuable. She said, you know, you're, you're doing nothing here. Like your mum, it's good you spend time with her, but don't, you know, get absorbed by this grief and this trauma. You've got to spend a limited amount of time here and you've got to look after yourself. And when you walk out of here, I want you to forget about your life. I want you to live your life and, um, and, and go about your, your, your life. And when you come here, give her your attention but don't hold on to it when you leave. And I thought, oh, that's pretty cold. You know, how can you do that? And this, this personal you know, experience with your mum that something's going so, um, so heavy. But I tried it and it was amazing. It's like some emancipation of feeling and, and I didn't have any guilt about it and I just thought, yep, I'll go spend a couple of hours a day with her and then when I left, I completely put her out of my mind. But what I did was I walked a lot and I walked the family dog. I was staying in my, with my dad at the time. Um, so another picture um, that my mum asked me to take. She, after everything, she then had a, um, she never got better. And she wasn't sure why. And the, the doctors found out that she had a big spinal tumor that was stopping her as she walking again. So after everything, she's like, actually, you've got to go for spinal surgery now. So she never saw her scar. So she asked me to take a picture of her, her scar. And, and, and that's it. But during the time that um, she was in the hospital, I would just walk and I would photograph and I was staying in the, in, the, in the house where I grew up and the landscape and the suburb around, I just walked in and photographed and that became a way to, I guess, process what was going on at the same time, not thinking about it, but dealing with what's there, the childhood memories. This, this picture actually, um, I, I put this in because it was one of the first pictures I made, but it also is the backdrop of a very large wall in the exhibition. So it's the only work that I have in the, in the show. So that's the backdrop. It's quite a bit darker with all the colour pictures on it. And um, there was something about walking with a film camera and photographing things without thinking too much, without thinking about what they meant, but just processing and appreciating light and shape and texture and, and all that stuff that just kind of really helped process what I was going through. Um, and so the landscape, later on, I think, you know, I don't photograph like in metaphorical um, terms in terms of trying to do something, but later when, when you look at the work and it, it, it sort of has time to rest, the photographs will actually reveal to you what you were what you were doing and what you were thinking about and what you were feeling. And so this this these landscapes became sort of representations of how I dealt with this time. Um, and another picture, Mum was always asking me to you know, take pictures of her um, needle marks where they took blood and things like that. So yeah, I think in terms of using photography and having photography, I felt really fortunate because I was able to, to walk and to be and to be present and allow, I guess, my own mental health to have a break from dealing with what was going on. And yeah, she recovered and she had another six years and, um, and then she eventually had a heart attack and passed away in 2017. But it was almost like when she did pass away, I'd already had that grieving process. Mm -hmm. And so when she did eventually die, I didn't necessarily have the sadness that I had back then in seeing her in hospital for this amount of time. And I feel really fortunate for, for those um, years that she got afterwards. But I look back on these pictures now and I really feel that photography helped in dealing with the, the trauma that um, that I was going through witnessing her going through. Mm. So, um, yeah, it, it, I think having that outlet and that medium to, to use is really valuable. Mm. And this, this is a, a, a picture of the, the sky, and I just kind of thought later that it fit in well because it kind of reminded me of the spine. Mm. So I kind of put that in. 
Thank you. Mm. <laughs> I actually wanted to ask, before today, mm. had you revisited those photos of your mum? And, and what sort of feelings did it stop? Yeah, I probably sound a bit choked up because it's the first time I've talked about it in, mm. in public. But, you know, I think there's... I love letting photographs sit and rest. Mm. You know, I, I think... You know, especially in the photojournalism world, newspapers, you, you, you make a picture, you've got to decide sometimes within minutes which one you want to send and, and put out there. And, you know, I think a lot of the group has sort of talked and this, this exhibition has brought up a lot of archive work. And I think that pictures with time and the way you change, uh, you become more objective with your own work, you start to actually see the photographs on their own merit rather than your own your close association with them when they've been made. I think it's really valuable to allow pictures to kind of breathe for a while and then come back to them because sometimes the, even the authors uh, have a hard time seeing what they actually make. And so what Rachel said about space I found really, really poignant as well because there is no rush. But the, the, the problem with our industry is it's all about rush. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of fighting something that inherently is not maybe the most um, beneficial thing for the medium which we're choosing. It's always this, this push and pull. And um, yeah, I find work really never gets old. You know, it, it, it actually just becomes more interesting over time. So, uh, you know, and we talked the other day, I said, I said to Abby, she asked when mum passed away, and I was like, oh, 2017, thinking, you know, that was five years ago. And Abby's like, oh, you're still, that's still very close, you're still in it. And, you know, so starting looking back at pictures that are eight, nine, ten years old, you can start to see maybe what's there and start to process maybe your own feelings about them and, um, and have some objective space to, to start thinking about putting it out into the world in some way, shape, or form. Dean Saul, one of our other members. Thank you. Um, this, uh, this body of work is from the 2004 uh, earthquake of Sumatra. Um, it occurred um, around 250 kilometres um, south of the capital and around 30 metres underneath the, uh, the ocean floor. Um, that earthquake was, was particularly large, 9.1, made it the third largest earthquake in the world it recorded. Only Superseded by um, Alaska in 1964, in Prince Alfred Sound, and in Chile in 1960. Um, that was, I think, Chile was 9.5. Um, and then we had Japan in 2011, which produced a similar um, tsunami. Um, I went over to, I decided to go to Malaga. I had a sort of a dual purpose in being there. Um, um, my work is um, is always informed by purpose. I have to have reason to be somewhere. Um, contrary to some of the pictures I show, I haven't had a life wandering around war zones and disasters and the, here and here and there. But I think it was really important. I think for Australian photographers to go there. Um, most Australians at the time barely knew Arche or where it was, um, and nor did they know that there was a war going on there for years. Um, so the, what the, the effect of the earthquake, besides affecting more, more than 1.7 million people globally and killing you know, around 250,000 people globally, um, it also impacted on the Indonesian military and they were decimated in areas like Malabo um, where they were fighting um, free Arche movement um, fighters. Um, I used, I wouldn't say exploited the fact that, you know, the Indonesian military was in disarray, but it was important for foreign observers to get into Arche as soon as possible, in my opinion. Um, in the year preceding the um, earthquake, there was not a single, one single foreign observer in Arche, um, nor press. Um, the last press member was an American guy who the Indonesians were chasing around 
some may remember the story, but he was um, hiding out with our Free Arche fighters, um, and the, um, the Indonesians were trying to capture him and throw him out. It almost tipped it over into a diplomatic scandal at the time. Um, so it was that pretext, but also where our government is invested with you know, like murderous military regimes around the world, I think you know, Australian journalists, photojournalists and documentary photographers have a responsibility in uh, addressing those issues. And so for that reason, I decided to go to, to Malabo, which is um, uh, Benda um, Arche's um, second largest city. Um, and I believe from what I could do, you know, ascertain at the time that this was the most impacted or the first impacted um, um, area um, across Arche. Um, I was lucky to get in there. I just went, um, I didn't have time to, it was, I mean, for me it was, you know, a, an event like this happening on Boxing Day. It's really hard to even find an editor or get an editor on the phone. And I talked um, to an editor here on the Bulletin magazine and told him how he didn't think that the story would hold up. Um, because at the time, I think they only you know, reported about 8,000 deaths, or well, they knew very little of what, what had actually occurred. Um, so their next publication date was the 17th of this, um, um, January, the following year. And, and, um, and he said, well, if you get back, they uh, will consider using your work. So I took off there, and uh, I, I didn't have time for a visa or anything, I, and, but I figured that I, I might be lucky getting around the, the Indonesians, you know, through the disarray that had been um, occurring there. So I'll, I got a flight, I, I jumped onto, a, um, I, uh, it was a German pilot, and he was, um, him and his wife had a lobster business in um, Sumatra, and they were flying lobsters out of um, Sumatra into Japan. And they had two brand new aircraft, which are sort of hollow body things. So they were uh, amazing, this couple. And they sort of put their lobster business on hold, removed all the racks, and started flying in supplies because no one could get into Malawi. You couldn't put a heavy uh, lift aircraft like a C 130 down on the, onto a, the runway because they were too impacted and you know, the cracks were so wide from the earthquake that even a C 31 would be swallowed up. Um, and, and so this guy was taking in fuel and anything at all that could be useful. And, you know, Nick Moyer, a um, you know, colleague, and um, he was the first guy to, to jump on the plane um, uh, with this German guy. He, he was quite happy to take in you know, journalists. So, you know, Nick got in there for, like, a, a land and, and get back out again. And he was on tight deadlines because he was working for a newspaper. Um, I uh, had no real anything, like, I had no commission or any guarantee of selling anything at all, but um, Nick got off the plane and he said, oh, yeah, get on, just give him a call. So I called him and said, can you take me in? He said, sure. And the next day he said, get the airport at six o'clock. And he, um, he flew me in there and I spent a couple of um, days um, on the ground. I, I got into Malabo on the, um, New Year's Eve 2004 um, on that day. Um, and I had two days wandering around the ground. Now, normally, you know, as photojournalists, documentary photographers, press photographers, whatever tag you choose to place on yourself. Yeah, there's a, there's a enormous, um, we, hold a, we hold a very privileged position in, in, in society and with that comes responsibility. And um, normally you should have a, a, a local translator. Uh, I, I think that they're really important for navigating like social issues and, you know, and sensibilities, you know, particularly cultural sensibilities. I had no time in this circumstance. It was like, like I wouldn't know where to find a translator. It was such a mess. Um, so I was really on the ground with nothing much around me going on. Um, and I was just wandering and, you know, doing what I did. And I, and I told the general pilot, I said, I'll come back, I'll meet you in a couple of days. I couldn't get back to the airport because I couldn't even, even with all the money in the world, I couldn't get someone to give me back there. There's no fuel. Mm -hmm. So even guys, you know, even though they were riding around, you know, like 100 cc motorbikes, whatever they had, uh, they, they couldn't even. It would have cost them to fill up like two dollars petrol or whatever over there, but they couldn't. I couldn't actually get anyone to take me back. And in the meantime, the the T and I picked me up because there was a, a, a skirmish. Um, that occurred there, and 
they knew I was in there, but they weren't sure where because I jumped off a truck um, when I was driven in by the military. And then they were going to take me to a police station to deal with my visa, which I knew I didn't have, so I had to get off the, 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 the truck and basically took off, so they, I lost, they lost sight of me and I then, and I could then get on with work. And, so they picked me up the following, um, following day and took me to um, you know, a holding you know, over a, a military compound where I spent the day in you know, house fresh, you could say. But it was not the experience that I imagined um, being sort of rounded up by the TNI. And in that, the several hours that I was held there, I found that I'd become a counsellor for most of the, for these TNI, TNI soldiers because um, they had a massive barracks set up on the beach, the, the, the military, and they lost the around in Malabo alone, probably a thousand TNI um, soldiers in their barracks um, when the tsunami came through. And mind you, it was 20 minutes after the actual earthquake, so no one, everybody was caught off guard, no one you know, knew it was coming, and uh, equally the TNI who got um, smashed. So um, I had a procession of the uh, TNI um, soldiers coming through the doors, mostly giving me a sort of some dry crackers and water. So I had a table full of crackers and water. And um, and and, and I, I, I took on the most unexpected role where I became my counsellor just to listen to their their stories. And you don't really expect that to occur, like when you're you know, covering you know such events. So it was a really unique time. So yeah, like at the end I lost seven you know, they'd all, they'd all have, have lost, you know, multiple, multiple family members. Um, uh, and so, yeah, that was, um, that was my experience in, in um, Arche, but, you know, I, I think it was, like, I grew up in, on newspapers through the 90s, and I started my career in the Herald in 89, similar, similar to Jeremy. We based at Southern and then right at the same time. And what I think a lot of people, people who were consuming newspapers then, I don't think they realised that, a lot of the news content was being done by kids. And it was, um, you know, like even up into the mid-90s, we were still chasing car crashes in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. You know, everything was just trauma. Like, everything was just disasters, boarding house fires, car crashes, you know, retrieving bodies out of the things. And this was being done by, like, when I look back now, a whole bunch of kids running around. Look, the News Limited State had a lot of, more than Fairfax. And, and um, and we were producing most of the daily news stuff that was occurring in you know, Sydney or Melbourne or, or whatever. And back then there was, there was no one, um, you know, how you know, kids are meant to deal with or like seeing this stuff all the time. You know, like today, if you, went, if you were with a, a newspaper, um, you'd most likely come back from a, like a war zone. I know Kate Derrick with the City Morning Girl has been in Ukraine. And that she'd be offered immediate counselling on her return. I think any um, any news organisation now would offer those sorts of services. Back then, we devised our own methods because um, there was nothing nothing like that. You know, photographing these things. They're not you know pretty. You know, like um, most people like the tabloids, like the the, the Daily Telegraph or the, you know you know it was only Melbourne. And most people write them off as you know just you know just ridiculous or this or that. But, a friend of ours, like Brendan Esposito, we pointed out one day, because he worked as a photographer across um, Fairfax and New Zealand, which is quite a rare thing to do uh, in Australia, to work for both sides of the, you know, the field, so to speak. He now works at ABC. But he, he pointed out one day, he said, yes, the Telegraph is the most heaviest paper in the world. You know, it, it's, it, it's, not, it's not life, it's not um, thing. <coughs> he just flicked to the papers, you know, mother and daughter dying house fire. You know, like uh, three killed in teenagers in car accident. And you looked at it, when you looked at it like that, you thought, that's all it was. It was just carnage, like, uh, you know, it was just full of just, you know, death and mania. And, like, we were doing that sort of stuff, like, um, and, uh, you know, like, I think if, um, you know, our methods of dealing with that was sort of, you know, in back room pubs late at night, you know, like, um, you know, absorbing pure old infantile jokes about what we're actually covering, and and, and, and that's, what, that's what it was like. And but that, that we created this like self mechanism of dealing with you know, trauma because there was no counselling um, back then. And so and I think so. Like a, we, we have friends who have completely almost got mad like from doing that sort of stuff. Like you know, no, no, Kessel is a 
He's a great example of with his nickname was Car Crash Pistol. Because that's what he did. Cars <coughs> wrapped around telegraph poles in the night. Or you know, like you know, corks and dangling from um, you know, backyard clotheslines and stuff, you know. Um, he had a couple of monikers like like that, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, I think he's he um, you know, I think the last call was when you know, he, he was he specialised in chasing ram raiders around Sydney. And, you know, he thought that'd be a good idea. Like there was a lot of uh, there was guys in the Lebanese community in, in Sydney that were performing with these ram raiders. And he was you know, chasing them, you know, and shooting them in the night, and they were dying in car accidents, and you know, and they were chasing him until they pulled the gun on him, you know. And and I think that's the, I think that's what they did in the end. They they pulled the gun on him and, and said, you know, like we need to stop this stuff right now. You're interfering with what we're doing. But I, I, I don't know what's happened to Noel, but you know, he's, I think he's a, he was a casualty in my opinion of actually photographing traumatic events. And, and um, we often look beyond our local scene and we always look at tra traumatic events overseas, but like there's just a host of trauma, even in little micro uh, um, amounts, like that happen every day to people's lives. And um, there are people that, um, Photograph it. Like I think in the in the past, uh, there was a, a, a myth that, that like people, if you had a camera up to your face, it, it would it acted as some sort of filter that you were sort of you know you were um, you, you wouldn't be affected by by trauma. But we do know now that, that like I think it, it, the science is is there that suggests that, like you know, exposure to just day in day out is just is can be devastating. Dean, sorry. So. You you speak about the effect of actually capturing traumatic events, but you also speak about the media saturation of traumatic events. The exhibition presents universal human experiences and their binaries. Do you think there's a responsibility of the media to actually provide the light with the shade? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, in a nutshell, uh, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, we don't see that from the media. Um, if you look at, I won't, I won't go down this road, but I'll just say on Ukraine, you know, there is a single narrative going on. And, and in many ways, I'm, I'm really disappointed by the global coverage. Like a lot of photographers that I know, either personally or from reputation, are basically in lockstep with the Pentagon, yeah, press centre. Like I can't see any photographers actually working to show any alternative narrative. Um, to events that are occurring there. Um, we are set, there, are certain, there are certainly journalists on the ground that are doing that, but not from our, not from the, the, the photojournalistic um, fraternity that are, you know, that are over there. They are all producing just one single narrative that there is no grey in what they're doing. It is black and white, and for the most part, it's, you know, it, it's, what Washington says, what the White House Press Room Centre and the Pentagon say, and all these guys are just fall into line with that. So, is there a responsibility? Yes. Is it being shown in, in cases like Ukraine? No. Is it also maybe because, um, or maybe, yeah, media doesn't want to show alternate, alternative views, and this is what supposedly people like this on the ground should be doing, right? Show sure, the whole story and different perspectives. But sometimes I wonder if it's risky for them because they maybe are going to you know, spend a lot of time in a story and then it's not going to be published. And of course, they will do because they care. But then, I don't know, I, I, I think it's, I agree with you. It's, yes. it's one, there's one view and I think it's, yes. it's dangerous as well. We, we don't see, like, yeah. but it's not the Ukraine, they are place of Afghanistan. We have yeah. always seen, one presentation of things, and when there are so many different things, and all the wars, it's the same, right? So, why, why do you think this keep happening? Well, I think there is there is media that are telling the truth. They become really hard to find because they're being algorithmed out of mainstream narratives. They're being pushed to the side, and anyone who's is not in agreement with the the, you know, the the singular Pentagon driven narrative. In Ukraine, they're getting alienated. So people are not seeing any uh, alternative views. They exist, uh, uh, um, but it, it, they're difficult to. They're increasingly difficult to find. And so while they're telling us to watch out at night time from the Russian oligarchs, they're stealing, killing children's 
bedrooms at night and chew their heads off. The, the, the worst oligarchs are like are your, your Bezos and your Musks and, and all of those guys that are controlling the media. That they, that these guys are, no one's paying attention to them because they've got Russian oligarchs in their mind. And, and the, the, these bogeymen, you know, dudes. And, and the real oligarchs that are most dangerous right now and most, um, that are really uh, threatening democracy it, it is the guys that are in control of the tech and, and media because they are sidelining, you know, anything that's um, different. Um, if you are interested in hearing more from Dean and also, I guess, understanding his lived experience in regards to Russia and Ukraine, he'll be showing work, some really, really interesting work from Russia that was recently developed. And we're having a slide night tonight. Um, I don't mean to silence or censor you, <laughs> but I just am conscious of time this morning and we haven't heard from our last person. And you, you know me, you know I say that in deepest respect for you, but I do want to just move over because yes, I'm yes. conscious of people's time this morning. So, Dave, floor's yours. I'll give up my spot here. <laughs> um, so, I um, came into photography with a, from a previous career in uh, social work. In Canada, so I worked, you know, primarily with people in crisis for about 12 years as my job, and um, in a very non-creative way, a very um, more of like a therapy support-based way. So my experience with trauma is kind of um, less informed from you know seeing my job as a photographer and as a photojournalist. <clears throat> truth and you know representation and more um, you know I've come to terms with the fact that I actually really um, in a strange way enjoy working with people who are in various states of crisis and that might sound you know strange or dark or weird but it's just something that I have discovered that over time you know um, it's, it, I, there's a certain attraction to it for me, and I, I guess at times I've felt guilty with that, or it's been, felt, you know, trying to understand it, but I think it's just, you know, <clears throat> um, it's a real human experience, and everyone has trauma to different levels, and everyone feels trauma to different levels. Some people might experience a, a, what is a textbook heavily, you know, a very traumatic event, and they'll be, <clears throat> impacted by that very differently to someone else who experiences the same event. And other people might experience something that on paper is seemingly not that traumatic, but it might affect them deeply. I find those nuances really interesting. But so I've, you know, in the last few years especially, really found myself questioning the value of photographic trauma and the value of showing other people traumatic experiences and what the context of showing those experiences actually means and how it, what is the outcome of that? What is, why do we want people to see these pictures? What is, what is the, the knock-on effect of that? And I think we've, we have hit a different point in, <clears throat> you know, news media in particular where I really question whether the value remains in how this work is being shared. I think we've hit a tipping point where we're seeing too much of this for it to actually grab people and impact people. And so I, as a result, I've really struggled with kind of photographing those kind of things. And so the work that I'm showing here is from a project I did about um, five years ago in Canada, which is where I'm from originally. And this is a community that's a northern, um, very remote, First Nations community called Attawapiskat. And Attawapiskat is not a place I've ever heard of or been to. It's a fly in, fly out only community. But about six years ago, it kind of, for a very flash moment, grabbed the attention of the world because they had a suicide epidemic. And it's a town of only about 500 people, 600 people. And they had over 100 suicide attempts in a five month period. Um, you know, the experience of uh, First Nations community in 
can is very similar to um, systemically what happened in Australia with Aboriginal communities. And so there's layers and layers of intergenerational trauma in a lot of these communities that's very, <clears throat> you know, complicated and nuanced and hard to understand. And, um, but what I saw, you know, because I was reading about this in BBC, New York Times, all of these things was, <clears throat> you know, I was seeing the same stock imagery being used of, you know, a run-down house with, um, you know, someone with their hoodie pulled over their head walking past and um, the same information being shared and, you know, I kind of got a bit really kind of interested in this and, and what I realized was like, no one's actually gone to this community. These, these people are all calling this in. They're using stock imagery to tell the story. Um, like, what the fuck's this town about? Like, what is this place? All I know about this place is that everyone's trying to kill themselves. And that's all any of us would know about this place. And I just kind of became fascinated about what, what is the outcome of that? Like, what does that actually mean? So I was, you know, part of the challenge that we all face now is funding. Because there's no editorial outlet that would have paid for me to just go up there and spend any length of time. And this is, you know, I'm not bagging out the journalists that have worked on this prior, but like, this is the truth, this is the reality. It's, of all the stories that were being done, most of them did not go there, and any of the ones that did, you know, and I kind of found this out after the fact, is they flew in in the morning on a flight, walked around town for five minutes, talked to the chief, talked to a couple other people, got back on the afternoon flight, and were out. And, you know, these stories to have meaning, like there's so much complexity there that needs space and time and stuff, and we just don't get that. So I was lucky I got a grant to go, and I actually got to spend a month there over two, you know, two, two and a half week chunks. And um, it really changed how I saw it, because when I first went, it was very much a story about, you know, suicide, and you know, kind of quite black and white of how I was trying to understand it. But when I got there, I really realized, like, this is actually a really beautiful town and a lot of really interesting people. And most of the basic facts around us had been skewed and were mistaken and the numbers were wrong. And there was, it was, you know, quite um, an eye-opening experience for me. Um, and so I think as a result, like the pictures <coughs> are with, you know, some exceptions. Um, I really wanted to try and shoot a little more poetically than probably I thought I was going to when I got there because initially it was like, okay, I need to get, I need to meet healthcare workers, I need to talk to mental health professionals, I need to get to the clinic, um, I need to, you know, do all these things and then I kind of, you know, realized very quickly that that's just, you know, the narrative that we expect and that editors expect a lot of the time and that as a result, the community expects. Like we, oftentimes when we look at stories around, you know, a First Nations community or an Aboriginal community or other places, we've kind of already been conditioned to think like, what this is like and what this means. And trauma doesn't, it's not something that can be boiled down. And I'm not suggesting that it's not important to cover big events, but like if you look at Jeremy and, and Dean's pictures that they've shown, the difference here is that there was no one there at that time. So they were in a position that, you know, I think a lot of photojournalists kind of aspire to be is like that if I don't do this there's a good chance that people won't know about this and there's a value in, in knowing to a degree and we've flipped now to the point where it's rarely the case that it's more often that you're competing for an angle or you're trying to um, you know we see it in Ukraine you saw the push fires like what Rachel was saying is that trauma sells papers sells stories 
and it um, perpetuates itself. And you know, this was work, and it's something that I'm much more drawn to now, moving forward. And you know, um, is I, you know, Jeremy saying how he liked, you know, being there, but then the experience of being there after is too difficult. And I find it really interesting because I'm exactly the opposite, where I can be there when it's happening. Um, but it's not my strength, like my strength and what I'm drawn to is the, the after, you know, when it's quieter and when, when there's a lot of talking and a lot of spending time. And they're both valuable um, in a way. And, um, but yeah, so I'm, I think trauma is something that representing in pictures, like we have to be really careful that we're always stopping ourselves and kind of addressing, like why is this valuable? I can get this picture. Um, most journalists I know learn the tricks of the trade and become savvy enough to get access mm -hmm. to things. And I, I know early in my career that was something that was always like a gold star mm -hmm. on your chest, is if you managed to get access to something really emotional and really deep and really heavy. And you know, um, editors who, if you're working in kind of the um, editorial industry, editors are your they're your boss, right? They hire you, they make big decisions, and so there's nothing better than coming to them with something that no one else has or that shows something. But there's also a lot of responsibility that isn't often gauged around working with people who are experiencing trauma. What, like, what's the impact of them when that's playing on ABC for the next five years, you know? Possibly like re-traumatizing them, or just making them feel, you know, is it is there? Where does the value weigh up? <clears throat> Which that's like an ongoing conversation for a lot of us, and for me, it's something that is is really big um, now. You know, with how I look at my work and how I look at other people's work is, you know, it's it's not actually that hard to make a beautiful picture of something really shitty. Um, and that doesn't mean that it actually has value and importance. Mm -hmm. um, but we've often been rewarded for doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to, I don't know if it's possible now with the climate that we work in with how work is shared because you can look at something that's incredibly dramatic and you know, sad and meaningful and then in the next second see something that's viral and, and you know, has a totally different context because of how we accept these Im images. Um, and I don't know what the, the solution out of that is, but for me personally, it definitely is just kind of made me want to work slower. Mm. I'm conscious of time, but I just want to riff off Daddy and quickly share some images from a project that I've been working on uh, with someone called Felicity. So just really, I think, because Dave articulated so well, that tricky, delicate balance and someone having a practice that's come from social work. And so in a similar way, I, my background's in community development. Uh, I've not really worked, at least since about 2016, at all in editorial work. Uh, so I work for NGOs, not-for-profits, and commissioned. But I've realised that the relationship is probably similar to David, is the real currency, and it's, it's working with people and almost like the visual is a supplementary aspect to how, um, how I do what I do, whether it's in stills or in video. Relationships are so key that it's so tricky because it's not cut and dry when I finish working with people. Um, Felicity is someone that I work with from the injecting drug and sex worker community and I work with them um, for some public health films and we stay in touch because I stay in touch with buddy dozens and dozens of people and they'll send me a photo or they'll send me a selfie with their baby or they got uh, housed and that comes with its own trickiness around how much time and how that impacts on you and how you try to support people if you should um, but Felicity and I uh, we talked about starting to make pictures together and have them reflect on those pictures as they have been, um, so they've recently transitioned from being uh, transgender to now identifying as non-binary. 
Um, and it's not for me to talk about what's happened in their life, but there's been significant experiences from very early childhood through teenage years and 20s. Um, and so for them, seeing themselves in pictures is what they believe is helping them to actually process some of their trauma. And a significant part of it is around self-acceptance. That's at least my observation of them and how we share photos and they will write back to those pictures. So this was in their backyard and, um, as part of them changing, um, I guess, how they identify, they decided to, to cut out the sides um, of their head. And, um, this is us making pictures. Uh, we went down to a new speech in Sydney, um, and they, I was, I never suggested them um, removing their clothes, and they thought they wanted to. And in that moment, they didn't, and very understandably, because I would feel pretty uncomfortable about getting off my kit for a portrait. Um, but we might do it again in the future. But we just keep talking. And I asked Felicity yesterday, I said, what would you like me to share that you want to say to go with the photos tomorrow really quickly when we have this session of trauma? And so um, this was from Felicity and been texting yesterday. And I just wanted to end there, I guess, because I think we're all trying to figure out how we worked with it or around it, probably tripping over and not as delicate as we would like. Um, and so I guess that if there was any other final comments or any final questions, I'm just conscious of time, you know, we maybe overstayed our welcome. No. Uh, Eric. Um, no. But if anybody has any questions for anyone else here? Uh, question, just an observation on the setting of this discussion raised, I actually think like the, the art gallery and the festival and, and Eric, I just want to thank you because these are the sorts of conversations the media should be having. These are the sort of conversations magazines, newspapers, institutions like that, that say they're about the media. These are the sorts of things they need to be hosting and discussing. And I think it's quite ironic that an art gallery is hosting a discussion on this because this needs to be in the JNI, this needs to be in the MEAA, this needs to be in every newsroom, magazine, if, uh, at least one picture editor here today. And I just think, how interesting that an exhibition made, curated by Oculi, with all, with all this sort of experience in, in journalism, this the stuff needs to be heard by the people and the industry which, in which it sits, that it takes an art gallery to do it. So I just want to say thank you, because um, I think it's really important. Yeah, 
I don't know what the, yeah, the social media side of thing. The media is too powerful, I think, at the end of the day. I think it's, a, it's got its, I'm its biggest critic. Um, but Can I add something to that? Like, I think, you know, it's a useful tool in a lot of ways, but the problem is um, there's a silver lining to it. And, but if you don't look at what the whole cloud is, you can focus on the silver lining, and it's actually it can be very detrimental, especially for people who, you know, whether you kind of see yourself, I think, as a photojournalist or a documentary photographer, or even moving into the, you know, the art space, so much of what we do is about like context and trying to get a message across. And we don't always get the message right. But there's a lot of duty of care that goes into trying to share that. And when you put that kind of work in a space like Facebook, that context is completely removed. And that work can go on and have a life of its own that you no longer have the ability to shape and share. And so in a magazine where you have people writing in, Again, it's not to say it was always correct. There's a lot of flaws in the history of how photojournalism has been shared and whatnot, but the context was there, and it was usually a relationship between a photographer and an editor and a mass, you know, masthead, and um, now, you know, images can be used for so many different things, and one of our colleagues um, photographed the Cronulla riots, you know, um, and made these very powerful pictures there of that. And then, you know, months later, he discovered that the images were being used, they'd been ripped offline and were being used on a, um, you know, a, like a, a popular front um, fascist kind of white um, supremacist group on their website. They kind of used those images and so completely out of the context of how they were created. So I think that for me is the biggest issue that I have this is I don't see the value in just having images spread quickly and rapidly. And I think it takes away the ability for them to, you know, they could just be used in so many different ways and then the conversations can go in a million ways, which has its benefits, but overall, I don't know that it's helping us accomplish what our actual goals are of helping people understand complex issues because complex issues get distilled down into a very quick and sometimes, you know, meaningless way on social media, in my opinion. Uh, I think also with regards to, like, online opening comments, the, the, the rise of social media, we're in a very, very infantile stage of understanding legality, and you see, I can't remember the, the publication, but there was a, a, a court decision that publishers were liable for comments that got published under their posts. And so what you'll see now is, um, a lot of publications probably fearful um, that the comments, because they're not controlled, they can't control the comments, they're actually responsible as the publishers for those comments. And so you'll see now on Instagram, a lot of, when you'll have a certain story, the Saturday paper does it, I know some other, they, they'll turn the comments off and they'll just publish it. And so I think that a lot of people aren't exactly sure how to tackle this and, and people are kind of fumbling their way through because you want to open it up to the discussion, but at the same time, you're very wary because you expose yourself to being the publisher at the end of the day. And this role of who is a publisher, who is an individual citizen, Julian Assange, like the whole battle of, um, you know, who is, a, who, is a new, who is a news organization and who is an individual with an opinion. You know, we're still very, very sort of um, early in, in understanding that whole sphere. And, and so there's a lot of, a lot of gray areas. So with regards, I don't think really anyone has a, an answer to how that, that navigation is gonna take place. But I think it's important that we at least, like Dave says, reflect on our position as the content sort of creators, the journalists, the photographers, to really consider, maybe considering even more how we go about having the responsibility to publish, you know, the, the stories that we're, we're publishing. Um, but with regard to 
comments and, and, and openness, yeah, I, I think we're still in a stage where that there's no certainty. No one, I don't think anyone really knows how to how it's going to going to play out. Um, Connor, you were really quick with your work and I really like the quote that you shared from Felicity about the process of photographing with you being a, a way to separate themselves from trauma. I was just wondering, like, was that a decision at the beginning? Like, how did it come about? Did that organically, did you both realise that was what was happening through the work or was it quite a deliberate decision at the beginning? It would be cool to think about, to hear about the conversations you're having about it, um, because it sounds like they were very aware that the, the photography was helping in, in some way. Felicity um, one night fell over and knocked out their front tooth, and being someone who's not able to access any welfare, any kind of financial support, they've had to seek, let's say, creative means to survive on a day in, day out, especially as someone who identifies as an injecting drug user. Um, so their sense of their self was super low and that's played out in, I guess, aspects of what they've done as ways to generate income. Mm. They have and they do identify as someone uh, who performs sex work, so I'm not disclosing anything that they don't already identify. And, and they speak at forums and in spaces and identify this way. Um, so they said to me, like, I am ugly, I do not think I'm beautiful. That was the early conversations when we were making films about overdose prevention. And I was working with them and a whole bunch of all, awesome motley crew and everyone was taking on the various roles. And so they said like, I'm ugly. And I said, bullshit. I said like, I've got this whole film camera, let's try and make a portrait that you, that you think is interesting. And I don't necessarily think that Felicity would say, I think I'm beautiful. But I think that that was like the opening of the envelope to just start to have a conversation about, okay, so you don't think you're beautiful, or you think you're ugly, or you can't look at pictures of yourself, but why is that? And they see the psychologist and the counsellor, so they, this is not replacing, this is not like a therapeutic process officially, but I do believe that it's helping them to unpack, especially now that, um, as I'm learning heaps about, you know, what it means to be non-binary, like, that means that they, sometimes they, and I'm using their language to say, I feel like I want to be like a femme dyke today. And then other days, like, I want to be super masculine. And Felicity is 6'1", flaming red hair. So Felicity is like, depends on what's happening that day and where they're at. And I've been learning heaps about how they see themselves. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. So when that picture came up, and is this the one that you said, let's try and make a picture together? This is, no, this is a little bit uh, later on. I don't have that one here. That was one under a tree. And so did they then give you feedback about what it was like to see themselves in a different like Initially they thought the picture was beautiful, they didn't like you know, they aesthetic they didn't necessarily but they okay. to this day don't see themselves as beautiful. They think the pictures are nice and, and lovely, they don't still think they mm. there's a lot happened there. Thanks. Yeah, look, um, I don't need to take the floor. I was really um, moved by your, the dilemma you find yourself in. But I suppose what I want to say is no one believes in the traditional media anymore. You may have trouble breaking through it, but it's simply falling apart because people don't believe the stories, they're not taking out subscriptions to magazines and particularly newspapers that just fall away. And journalism on TV, it has the same sort of nasty smell about it. So, in a way, it's not just you against them. It's a whole huge lot of people out here against traditional media as well. It's definitely a tricky market. There's, there's the problem that all the experience has disappeared in the media, so your product actually is not as good as it was because there's no one left. And it comes down to the subscriptions, it comes down to the no one believes in the media anymore. So it's, you're not going to subscribe to something that's not, not a great product anyway, but that's because no one's subscribing and no one's, so that you've lost all the experience of redundancies and all the, one, all the knowledge has just disappeared. So there's not, not many there that can really, there was like a 10 year gap between mentorship, we grew up with mentors and people who actually we followed. But, 
have 28 photographers in one dark room back in the day, you know, we just continue to learn all the time. But the process has changed, yeah, there's no mentorship, and that's where I think we, as a group, it's really, it's pretty much our core, I think, it's nurturing and, and, and educating up and comings or new fledgling photographers, documentary makers. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's an important role to actually have that mentorship, to learn the experiences along the way, because there's a gap now there between what was good and what was mediocre. Now it's mediocre, you know, it's made, 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 and it's... It's de debatable though, like to your point, what, it's the chicken or the egg, what comes first, because it's, it's not to say that there aren't right journalists still working, but it's whether people are trusting that is, I think, you know, and I hear your point, you know, that there is a lack of trust, and there's some good reason for that, you know, um, in some ways, and um, we're, it's not to say that the traditional media was doing a better job even of being, you know, there's, you know, I hear stories from kind of, you know, uh, some of our members who worked in papers, you know, kind of early in their careers, and some of the things that photojournalists would do, you know, um, the very unethical, you know, staging photographs and making things happen, and that's that's always happened. And I think now it's just a lot easier to find out about these things and for that story to spread. And so the seed of doubt has been planted and people question it. So I don't know how much the media has changed to make it untrustworthy versus how much people are just becoming more aware of alternative narratives. They're becoming more aware of, you know, what's actually happening. And, um, and then at the same time, the actual media themselves have different barometers of how they have to run their industry. They, you know, it used to be if a story went out, it was very hard to gauge whether that story was successful or not because it went out in a magazine and you don't really know who picked that up and read it and who didn't, you know, um, compared to now where everything is tracked, everything is measured. If a story doesn't get a lot of clicks, it registers with the editorial department and they say, well, that, our, our viewers aren't interested in that story. So you get in this cycle, and, and not to say all publications do it, but you know, I've had editors say to me before, if I pitch something, they're like, our, our readers aren't interested in that. And it's like, that's the point. We're trying to get them interested in that. Like, we're not trying to just give them food pellets that we know they like, but that can be the case. And it plays into the concerns that you have around trust. And, and it, it, I don't know how we get out of it, to be honest, but I think you know, all we can really do is just try to do our best within what we have the ability to, to do. And, you know, things like this even are an opportunity for that. If we, you know, can talk to people about how we approach it, hopefully there's an understanding. And I think that, sorry, just another big, big, big problem with mass media, traditional media, and visual stories is that, um, Newsrooms, uh, there are many people that don't really understand the value of visual stories. So, for, for many of them, it's just about, yeah, you can go there, take a picture, it doesn't take much, you know, you don't need to be a photo, you don't need for to make that, that story, it's very easy to take pictures. And they don't really understand that telling stories with pictures, it's much more than just click, we all know that, right? So, and I'm saying this because I work in media organization and there is no money so basically when you have to put pictures in your story most of the time you just go in stock you just you just use pictures that are there for free and you just pick pictures that are maybe what you think is very dangerous but it's not the whole story so they don't really understand the value of photography and telling stories with pictures, which is different than just book and click. I mean, a pictures, when you see these kind of pictures, you understand that it's very different in the time that there is. So they don't value it, and this is very frustrating because when you understand, it's like, wow, people, of course, people, they don't subscribe, they don't, they don't trust because they don't see anything different than what they can find on Facebook. Mm. So, you know, and again, with comments, 
on the pictures on Facebook or on social media. It depends on what the pictures that you see. Of course, I mean, and it's all about beautiful pictures. But then, someone was saying before, I mean, you, it's easy, maybe you were saying, it's easy to say a beautiful picture. It's, I mean, a nice picture, but the meaningful picture, you need time and stuff. And unfortunately, they don't understand. This is a big, I mean, this is my biggest question. Like, how do you find that? Even from inside, it's very frustrating because when I say, you know, we should pay for these pictures, I have, and they say, oh, come on. I mean, you know, that. I have a story. For example, last year I did a story and I interviewed a friend of mine who is a photographer and he was working in Italy when, you know, everything started with coffee. And he put him at risk, like, Everybody on the ground, because at the beginning we didn't know what COVID was about, what were the risks and everything. And I interviewed him about his story, so what, how did you feel, and blah, 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 blah. And then, of course, I needed pictures. But I said, no, I won't ask you to give me pictures for free. I just need, I just asked him for a um, selfie. And he gave me that selfie. And then, of course, the editor said, oh, Francesca, we need more pictures. And I say, okay, but we will pay them. We don't have money. And I say, well, I got that. So they really wanted, and at the end, we managed to pay like maybe hundred dollars for a couple of features. But then it was, I was like, okay, I mean, it's something, right? But it, again, it's not about the money. It's like I had to fight, and they were telling me, oh, you know, at the end of the day, we got the photographer that you interviewed. We paid more than what we paid you for the article. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, it's very meaningful what you are saying for me. And, you know, and, and, and you're not putting value on my job, on his job. And this is the real big, big, big problem. So the thing is like, okay, so how do we do? What do we do? How do we fight this? Because then the second time I tried to get this teacher, I had another to get them uh, buying other pictures, they were like, no, Francesca, we want a budget for it. And I said, okay, fair enough. Yeah. So, you know, and it's so frustrating. I mean, it's terrible. It's a story about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, and, 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 but it's horrible. So, how do you, from the inside, because I'm lucky, I, I can do something. Yeah. For example, how do you, what do you do? Back in the day, when I went to Team well, that was 20 years ago. I think it cost me seven thousand dollars to go there, and I only got a thousand bucks back. So. <laughs> I think so that we could almost get a coffee and keep talking, some of us. But I know there's like a lot of people that are packed and waiting, and I want to thank everyone, especially the Penala community who's coming up today. Um, we really appreciate it. There's a slideshow at five o'clock. There's a number of other events tonight. If you want to keep chatting, we all would love to keep chatting. <laughs> but to those who had somewhere to be, thank you very, very much. Uh, we do have another event at 2 o'clock at Tommy Tim giving a talk about her show. But I really want to thank our panellists, some fine words from Sean, but really this type of discussion is made possible by photographers who have a responsible practice and are continually re-evaluating their personal and professional ethics and methods. Um, and that's admirable, but it's even more brave to have those discussions in a public role. So thank you very much. <laughs>